Welcome to Emotional Sobriety. How are you and Didi? What What is your relationship to the election? How much do you care or are you giving yourself permission to care? And is there any tension, just ambient tension uh, around this time with you and your fellows? Well, first of all, I care a lot. It's uh, um, uh, uh... And I'm very, very, I'm very concerned. I'm very worried about it. Well, well, I'm, I, I can't say worried because actually, my my emotional sobriety or stoic stoicism practice is to live in the present moment, which uh, which is to realize that worry is wasteful energy. So I, I do my I do my very best to not be worried at any given time, but I am very concerned and. Um, I always have. I have been for a long, long time. That's why, you know, like I told you, I began. I began uh, after nine eleven writing that political commentary because there was just uh, my experience back then was that. I mean, I sometimes I couldn't. I couldn't go to work until I wrote something uh, and got something out there and on online with, with the blog that I was doing. I was doing a blog with Salon dot com. Uh, yeah, it, until I had written something about uh, what I was writing about then was George W. Bush and uh, was not was not speaking as a therapist as much as I was writing a, a political satire. Yeah, more as a, more as a citizen, because it, because citizen, it, not a Because it bothered yeah. me and I couldn't do, I had to do something. I had to say something. I had to do, <laughs> yeah, I had to make my, I had to make a contribution or I wouldn't be okay. Yeah. Yeah. And at the time, uh, what it, it had to do just with the kind of post uh post 9-11 jingoism and Iraq war. And it was, I mean, that was the aspect of the Bush administration the, that the, you were responsible. The li- yeah. The lying, the deceiving, the, you know, all is no, no WMDs. That was, yeah. That all that. Yeah. I mean, that, that among all the other things, it's like, you know, not to mention um, the use. And I, I wrote several things about how, you know, that whole administration just, I mean, we forget it now in comparison with what we've been through, but it's it's like, I mean, they just stoked f- fear for people in order to get what, what they wanted to get done. I mean, bottom line is they scared everybody so that they could, uh, Dick Cheney and uh, Dick Cheney mainly and, and George Bush could then invade Iraq, who had nothing to do with 9-11. <laughs> So I mean, yeah, there was there were lots and lots of lies, lots to write about, lots to in my and my my approach at the time was lots to make uh, fun of. Really, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't making light of it, but it was with satire. It was making fun of it. Yeah, well, I mean, the the most truthful um, journalism at the time, the, or the most truthful feeling to me, um, and I of course you wouldn't call it journalism; it's more, it's more satire. Was just watching John Stewart. During those Bush years, I think oh, in college, oh, absolutely. yeah, that's what I wa- we all watched it. I know many people. Yeah, we many of us just we got our news there because mm-hmm. because we got the actual news and and we got somebody who could who could also comfort us with humor. Yeah, and also, and I know you're a fan of his, Al Franken. I had his book, uh, Lies and the Lying Liars Who Tell Them, yep. and I I, I mm-hmm. read that. Mm-hmm. I remember love, uh, love Al Franken, 2004. Yep. Yeah, I had the paperback. Um, so okay. Drawing a line from your experiences then and your experiences now going into the 2024 election, uh, are, would you say that like your um, your practice surrounding, you know, these times and especially in dealing with other people you care about who may disagree with you? Are, are, do you have a more emotionally sober framework by through which to like experience this hmm. and deal with it? I don't go looking for people who differ with me if I if I don't if there's not a need for us to be talking about this. It's like I live I live in a red state. I live in a red county. Um, you know, I know many many people here that we interact with on a day to day basis that are uh, no doubt polar opposite sides politically. I'm not I'm not I don't attempt to get into to um, discussions with them, and I'm sure I I'm pretty good at. at sidestepping when if they want to if they want to do that with me uh the, the so part that's part of the difference from i would suggest is my emotional sobriety is is that basically i don't just i didn't before i think i would just go do battle because i wanted to do battle you know i just i got you know I, I'm, we talked recently on one of the thursday night mm-hmm. meetings about anger as a defense and I, one of the things i was i was sharing with alan and and uh, Herb and, and and you you might have been right there too I can't remember but it's like was that um, 
the, oh, one of my defenses in the past has been anger for sure. And, and I would just, I would love to be angry at people. I'd, be, I'd love to be in those kinds of arguments. And I would love, you know, and I would love to see if I could land a couple of good, clever punches and stuff. So I, I kind of sought that stuff out at one point. Now, the, one of the big differences, there's several differences, but one of the differences, I don't do that. But the other, the other big change became because, um, I loved writing the satire that I wrote uh, in the early part of the century there, but um, I also realized I was just I was writing I was writing um, I was preaching to to my own choir. It's like there was nobody reading what I wrote and having a change of heart or a mind. Oh, I never thought of it that way, and so and that's fine. That's a once one. That's probably what satire is more about than anything. It's. Uh, but when I also, with some some challenges from some other people in my life, um, I realized that what I wasn't doing was I wasn't applying my ther- my therapeutic voice to looking at at, at, at politics. And I realized if I was going to do that, that was going to be quite different because I, you know, I can go into a, a therapy session with somebody that I disagree with vehemently about their content of what they're talking about, and I can still do therapy with them. You know, I don't, I don't have to, you know, there may be places where I have, we have to make a distinction. I may have to own what I, what I believe about that, but I'm not talking about politics. I'm just talking about people in couples therapy, for instance, it's it's like, uh, um, my, my job is, is to get in there and help people who are in, in crisis. Uh, and it, and it really can't depend at all on what my particular opinions are in terms of the content of that. And that's, and that's, that's when I started writing the thing that I called with salon.com. I wrote, I wrote the blog called same page with the idea with, could we get, you know, being saying, could we get, could we get our political parties on the same page? This was before, uh, this, this was all written before Trump uh, was president. Um, but so that was what, that was originally that. And, um, and then later it became this poly, the thing I have on my website now is it became a thing I call therapy for politics, which is, uh, which is a step back. It's not, it's not discussing the, the content. It's discussing the, 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 the way we, the way we, the way we don't communicate effectively around politics and how we could improve our communication. I could really use some improvement when it comes to that. I'll tell you. Patrick, before you jump into that, let's put it in context in terms of what, how we came to decide to do this um, podcast at this particular point in time and, and what um, has motivated us to try to spend some time talking about how to deal with all of the, of the experiences that we're going to be having over the next week here which are going to be buried. I mean, some of us are going to be celebrating and some of us are going to be terribly disappointed. And some people are going to be thinking about moving to Canada, depending on how things go. I mean, other people are, you know, thinking of civil unrest. I mean, it's, there's such a wide range right now of feelings and reactions to this whole thing today. Um, And we thought that what, you know, there's not a better time to talk about how to use some of these tools that we're learning in emotional sobriety to cope with this situation, similar to what we've done about going into the holidays in the past and how to use some of these tools we're learning to cope with the stress of that. You know, this stress occurs once every four years for a presidential election, now more frequently for the senatorial and other elections. But here we are, again, confronting a, a very, very polarized choice in our nation. And, um, you know, we've been polarized for the last 12 years, I think we could pretty much say. Um, <clears throat> and so all of us, depending on our political orientations, are experiencing this in a very, very different way. And yet we're all in the same room. See, that's the, the weird thing is that even though we're polarized in terms of our beliefs, our ideas, what we think is right, we're all living in this wonderful country called the United States. 
And so we all are thinking about what's best from, for this country from very, very different points of view. So we want to talk about that. We want to talk about how to handle this, how to handle differences that are occurring, and how to especially deal with the outcome, regardless of what it is. It's interesting. I did, did it just recently with a new couple I was seeing. Uh, where I introduced a couple who was really in polarized position and, and who's really upset with each other. Um, and we, and Alan, you know, this is, is like, you know, what they're there, what each of them is there for, at least one of them is there for is to get you to, to acknowledge that they're right and their partner is wrong, you know, and that's not what we're there to do as therapists. You know, what I explain, I begin to explain to them and have to explain to them for a while is I'm there for what process, not content. What I want to do is talk, I want to watch how they communicate not what they're communicating about necessarily. And so, you know, I want to, and what I'm going to do is, is I tell them I'm going to interrupt you a lot because I'm, I want to, I want to show you some things that you probably have never, never looked at in terms of your communication. And the same thing is true in this bigger picture with, with politics. Bottom line is we, we're in this situation now, but we'll be in this situation repeatedly if we don't change how we communicate as, as a, as a nation among our, among ourselves. And uh, that's that's what I'm always looking at. We, there's a there's a way there's a way there has to be a way to get out of the polarization. You know, we'll never be we'll never be rid of it entirely. We never have been. But but, you know, uh, Alan and I certainly lived through a time where we weren't as polarized as this. But the bigger issue, I think, is deeper than that. For me, it goes to a level of maturity and differentiation. You, you see, the, the more undifferentiated we are, the more fused we are. So the more we're going to say things like, you make me feel. <laughs> because that is my experience. See, when I'm undifferentiated, I am actually, my feelings are actually being determined by what you're doing. Now, oftentimes, and you know this, and you've said it, and I've said it as a therapist, we intervene and we say, well, wait a minute. You know, nobody can make you feel anything. What you feel is what you feel, Right is to say it. I, I feel this way and instead of, you know, blaming the other person for it. But see, I think there are times when we do that or when I've done that, I'll just take responsibility for this. And I miss the bigger picture for me. The bigger picture was the fact that the person really does feel like you make me feel this way. That's how they experience the world. And see, that's what we're up against is that when we're undifferentiated, there is no, and I will underscore this loud and clear, there is no room for differences. If you don't think the way I think, if you feel different than what I feel, it threatens my sense of togetherness or my sense of my existence. And this is what creates so much difficulty, is it becomes a life or death issue for people. If you don't believe the way I do, then somehow I'm going to become a non-being. I'm not going to exist anymore. That this world that's going to be created by our differences is going to be something that excludes me and leaves me out and doesn't care for me. And see, when you got that underneath as the, if you will, the fire that's underneath this pot that's boiling, it's a big problem. It was very interesting. I had a reaction. I have a, a client of mine that lives in Israel. And um, he was talking about the election coming up. And I was very surprised at his perspective. And it shocked me on the one hand. I thought for sure that he would be on one side of the political spectrum. And he took this whole other perspective about what was going on and 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 saw attributes in a person that I haven't even looked at that way and thought that this person would be the best option for not only the United States, but the world. And it was such a different perspective than I have, because, you know, for me, you know, I'm, I'm someone that really believes I'm not an isolationist in terms of our country. You know, I believe we are part of a much bigger picture right now and that things have changed really. It really started with World War II, with the global response, right, to Hitler, to Japan, to Italy. Um, 
And and I, I think that in many ways that that we've continued down this this path. I mean, I'm not a historian at all, but it best based on my limited knowledge. I think the world is is so different today with all of the technology and information. We're more global than we've ever been. And so for me, anything that doesn't address that in some way doesn't address the full problem. But that doesn't affect some t- people in terms of where they live. Going to the grocery store, for those folks, it's it's a different story. And also in terms of fear, Tom, you know this and I know this. The more undifferentiated you are, the more you live your life out of fear. The more fear controls your life. And you, what happens when fear controls your life? Somebody comes along and promises you that we'll take care of all the things that are scaring you. What are you going to do? You're going to be very, very, very dependent on, right? Because in that low differentiation, we believe somebody's coming. <laughs> we want somebody to come. Both sides uh, feel that uh, this, the conflict is existential um, because the decisions being made or the vote is paying for something that will dictate public policy that we'll all have to um, live under. So, um, and, you know, the struggle for me becomes, uh, and I'll contrast uh, this election year, 2024, with 2020, where we were in the middle of COVID and, you know, um, it was pre-January 6th, but like, you know, it was a very, uh, I would say, more chaotic and more kind of like intense and violent feeling uh, moment than the one we're currently going through. But like when I wanted to have the fight. What what was the difference for you for that? Because I I kind of sensed that in some way, in some way, I I think it's as explosive. But in what way do you sense that? Well, this this sense that democracy itself is under siege. You know, Trump wasn't an an incumbent during uh, 2020, whereas now he's more of uh, an outsider, even though he once was president. And, you know, there was a lot of... um, talk of, you know, um, votes not being counted or the states, you know, had kind of like splintered off and that states that are responsible for counting the votes were kind of like signaling their unwillingness to um, do the right thing, I guess, when uh, it got to the the, the time when everybody's going to be casting their vote. Um, and, you know, there was a, because of the unrest. Uh, you mean for the Electoral College? Yeah, the Electoral College. Um, and then, you know, because of the unrest, you know, uh, having to do with police brutality and uh, and also and this was during covid um, and Trump really likes to roll out the police and he likes to roll out the military. And there was I think there was a fear that there would be if there was some uh, contest in the results of the election, that the, that there would be some violence that would spill out onto the streets and that there there would be a president who would be willing to deploy um, you know, uh, violence against uh, the population, maybe in ways that uh, I hadn't seen before in my lifetime. And uh, and so that was the uh, the uh, tenor of 2020. And that made my conversations with people about their vote a lot more fraught because uh, and that and I, that's what I wanted to get to, basically, was just the question of responsibility of, um, you know, uh, uh, wh- whether you vote one way or another, how much are you really <laughs> uh, fucking your fellows by choosing one option over the other? And how much do you need to really be taking that fight to somebody over their head, you know, who's truly responsible for kind of like whatever the thing is that you don't like, you know, uh, for or against. Um, and uh, I guess this is an opportunity for me to come clean. Um, I felt bad, Alan. We were uh, talking the other day and uh and I didn't tell you that I did not vote for Harris. I, I, I left my ballot blank. It was my first time uh, not voting for the Democrat at the top of the ticket. I've been voting since 2004, Kerry. And anyway, my sponsor got really pissed at me about that. And, you know, he views this uh, election as existential. And so we had some back and forth about it. And so I sent him this email. Um, I sent him, Danny. I hate to disappoint you with my rhetoric surrounding the vote or the vote itself. A couple weeks ago, I saw footage of a child burning alive in a hospital parking lot in northern Gaza while still attached to an IV bag. I hadn't felt such primal revulsion and pain watching someone die since I watched George Floyd being strangled. About a week later, when Sinwar was killed in combat, Harris made a succession of statements affirming Israel's right to do whatever it wants and framed this conflict yet again in in the narrow context of October 7th. 
I see in Israel an expression of the worst side of America, and there hasn't been the faintest signal from the Harris from Harris that she will be different from her predecessor. This is my first time not voting for the Democrat at the top of the ticket. If Harris wins, it will be historic. The first woman, POTUS. I wish I could be a part of that. I would also like to vote against Donald Trump. Yet again, he is a hateful, incompetent worm with no good human or leadership qualities. My vote is the only piece of power I can exercise at this moment. I go to protests and I post, but the vote is the only thing that will really be counted by the powers that be in all this. If I spent the last three years after the collapse of Build Back Better railing against the Biden administration and telling anyone who would listen how much I disagree with the direction this country is going, and then I went ahead and voted for them anyway, maybe these were beliefs I never had to begin with. In the most pragmatic sense, what you've said is correct. Only one of these people will be president, and Harris is objectively the better choice. But I want change. While we wait for change, too many people die. I was proud to vote for all of the down ballot measures in California that give me some hope. If Harris wins, as I would prefer, you can claim some credit for that. And if she loses, I will bear some responsibility for that outcome. I suppose I'm taking a calculated risk. Love you, dude. I did my best to account for my feelings without telling him his were stupid. Um, and I don't believe they're stupid. I had a friend ask me, I, uh, part of my calculation is that I live in a safe blue state, California. Um, the, the outcome of this election will depend upon uh, the electoral college, uh, who carries the electoral college. Um, but I had a friend ask me like, well, if you weren't living in a blue state, you know, if you were living in a purple state, would you then vote for Harris? And I thought about it and I said, well, you know, um, for the women in my life, you know, because of, uh, you know, the, uh, because of, uh, the right to an abortion, uh, that's under, ta- under attack. And I would, I would pull the lever for Harris in that instance, but I felt, uh, that, you know, I, since I get to kind of do this election on easy mode, uh, that this was, uh, this was just my call. And, um, I guess, uh, you know, I can edit out some of that email or whatever to clean it for the podcast, but like basically, um, um, I'm going it alone on this one. I'm not, nobody, nobody's really happy with me. I've got a lot of love for my fellows that vote either way. And I've become a lot less um, to, uh, vote policing of other people. You know what I mean? Because I know that we've got all got a lot of kind of intense and emotional um, uh, opinions flying around and that this voted belongs to us at the end of the day, if we really believe in a mo- democracy everybody kind of gets to do what they want to do with this little teensy bit of power that they get to exercise. Like you said, Alan, every four years, every two years. And, you know, and I think the broader conversation is that there's so much more, there's so many more ways that we can be good to our fellows. And there's so much many more ways that we can participate in democracy uh, and be involved in our communities uh, that don't have to do with just uh, a, a circle on a piece of paper. I'm talking about an entirely different thing. You guys both have talking about, you, I talked about process versus content. And you both went to content. It's like, which is fine to have those discussions in process. The, the issue is re- respect does not agree necessarily uh, mean agreement. And so in process is in terms of working with people about communication is what we're going to, what we are going to do the three of us today, which is, you're not going to, you're not going to be, you, we may have different opinions, but we're not going to judge you. Uh, you know, you, you're going to be your, your opinion as an, as an individual person, as, and as our, as our friend and colleague is respected. I mean, that's, that's one of the things, I mean, I'm, we can't do, we can't fix all of this communication stuff at one time, but the truth is there is so little even, I mean, just read, go, if you don't read my stuff, read, read Marshall Rosenberg's stuff on nonviolent communication, you, you know, there has to be, a, there has to be some way of, of us getting to the place where we listen to the other people without the, without the mindset of, do I agree or disagree? But, and it's exactly what we teach couples in, in couples dialogue. Don't listen to see if you agree, see if you can understand from their perspective. And that's, and what you just did is this, you described from your perspective, what your thinking is, which absolutely is valuable. Well, Tom, what you're yeah, saying that's is what we all need. That's what we all need to be doing. Essential yeah. ingredient here that you're talking about is empathy. Yeah, and and right, just being able to put yourself in somebody else's shoes and try to listen. To- and none of us are great at it. I don't think <laughs> you talk about differentiation. We built. We all need a different re- de- definition of respect because at this point, with all the stuff that we're des- well, all of us are describing, the word respect is, is synonymous with agreement. 
in our in our political maybe in other places it's not but in, in our political culture it is so it's like therefore there really is no place for respect if, unless we are in agreement and it's like you know we know as as communi- as communication helpers hopefully communication experts you know like that's that's a that, that's a serious problem in any communication if 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 we have to agree before we can proceed you know like one of the things i'll do with people is i'll ask you know I'll say in order to be able to do this we we need to be able to a- to answer a, a rhetorical question a rhetorical question in this case was would be if um to, to somebody who supports uh, uh, Trump, if if Trump said was if this is and you have to understand what people don't, have to understand what a hypothetical is. It's hypothetical. If if Trump was consistently saying the things that Kamala Harris was saying, and if Kamala Harris was saying the things that Bush, I mean that Trump is saying, would you change your mind about who you who you would support? If you can't do it, if you can't handle a hypothetical, you're going to say, no, I wouldn't. But anybody, anybody who can understand hypothetical can say, yes, of course, which me, all it means is I'm listening to, the, to what they're saying, not to just who they are. When you talk about seeing that child, which I agree is a horrible thing to witness. Um, my thought went right away to what happened in Germany at, near the end of the, the war and what the extents that the Allies had to go through to try to bring um, Germany to its knees to surrender, right? And to shift what they were doing. And one of the things that happened was this decision to bomb Dresden with these with these um, incendiary bombs. You know about that part of history, Patrick? I do, yeah. And, and Hiroshima as well around... This time. Hiroshima as well, in terms of dropping the bomb to to take a power that was what we would all consider to be evil. I mean, there's no way I can take and shift my perspective to justify what was going on in Nazi Germany and their attitude towards other people. And no way I can do the same with Japan in terms of the brutality that we saw. Not to say that there wasn't brutality on both sides. There was. There's horrible things that are done in war to for one side to win and the other side to lose. And each side is trying to win. There's no question about that. Um, so when I see that and I think about the thousands of people that burned to death, women and children in Germany, and still the German people wouldn't rise up against Hitler. They continue to support Hitler. In fact, they volunteered after that in droves to be part of his what uh, army of the of the popular people. I forgot what Volkstrom or something like that. And um, so, what do you do in a situation like that? See, what do you do when the populace is supporting a regime that is bent to destroy another group of people or several groups of people? See, this becomes a big challenge in terms of what nations do. I can't, it's hard for me. I, I, I'm not smart enough to pass a judgment on that. But I, I even go to Ukraine, I start to think about, you know, so if Kamala comes in, there's a continued to be support for Israel and Ukraine. I know very much so. I, I think that Trump will continue to support Israel. He Absolutely. gets a lot of money from Israeli donors, trust me, that, I mean, and he will continue to support I don't think he'll support Ukraine because of his alliance with Putin. And so then I start to think about that in terms of these Ukrainian people doing the same thing we did back in the 1700s, fighting for independence. And see, it's like how? And for me, I'm also concerned about our country. You know, it's like how do I integrate this whole global perspective of what's going on that I believe in independence of people and freedom? And I believe in each country's right to defend themselves and and especially from people that want to do harm and stuff like that. Um, I don't know. I don't know how to, to pass judgment on on siding with one side or not. You know, you know, I loved their both her response and Biden's response is that this is an opportunity to end what's going on. And then Yahoo chose not to do that after Sinwar was was 
you know, assassinated or killed in combat. I don't know. I wish there could be an end to what's going on in Ukraine right now. I wish there could be somehow peace now that they're getting northern North Korean troops. I hear now the estimate is it's not just 12, 100, 2,000. It's thousands of Korean troops are going into Russia. What's that going to do? I mean, how is that going to escalate things? I mean, are we on the precipice of World War Three? I mean, you know, what do we do? Do we concede like that the English tried to do and let and let Putin take Ukraine? And then what happened in World War II? Did Hitler stop there? Of course not. You don't stop a dictator that way. I don't know the answer to these things, man. I'm afraid of our future. I'll tell you that. I think that we are on, you know, globally, we're on the precipice of World War III. This is the beginnings of it in all kind, in all areas, not just over in Europe, but in the Middle East as well. I think that decisions are being made. Iran's making certain decisions in terms of attacking Israel and, and their response to defend themselves. It gets complicated to me. One point of agreement is, raise your hand if you disagree with this. This is fucking extremely complicated. Everything about it is complicated. Every, every All right. Yeah, these are questions. Not, there's not one yeah. of us who doesn't know that. There's a progressive uh, that I really admire. And he, when he was asked about what his um, political point of view is in general, he said, I want the best outcomes for the most amount of people, whatever you want to call that, you know? And um, if I have any guilt about not participating in this vote this year, it's that I do think that under a Harris administration that, that the outcomes will be better for more people. There were like 500 memos that the Biden administration had seen that Anthony Blinken had seen saying that um, U.S. bombs were used to uh, to kill children, basically, to airstrike children. And I think I was reacting in, in my in my abstaining from the vote with a kind of like, yeah, rage at the kind of callousness that was on display from the, this person running for president, that, 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 that such a thing could be countenanced. Well, let, let me tell you this fellow in Israel's view. Now I can say this. He thinks that Kamala Harris is, is pro-Palestinian. Regardless of what you saw in the news over here, what they're getting over there is they see her as pro-Palestinian. I hope she is, you know. Well, I, I, what I think she's trying to do is what you're talking about. What's the greater good here? This is a perfect example of what I've been talking about because I'm having the exact same experience I had with this couple a, uh, a few weeks ago when I first had a, the, the first two sessions with them is there was no way I was going to get them. I would go to process 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 they would always come back to content 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 and trying and 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 trying to win win the argument it's it's like uh which is i'm not against winning arguments i'm just saying we got you know we, we it's what you're saying actually alan the maturity of that is to go underneath that and to find that ability to getting a part of the conversation done that that just doesn't get done as long as we're polarized you're right tom is that things can what I would say devolve into winning. But if the focus is more on the relationship and on staying connected, we can learn to cooperate with integrity. It's not always about submission, right? We can learn to change our perspective and take in what somebody else is thinking or one point, one point we're making here today is we got three people uh, in a political they're far, far more than anything else agree, tend to agree with each other on most everything there is to agree about in the in the bigger picture. Right. And we listen to our argue, listen to our conversation. You know, even the therapist is jumping into it, arguing and, and feeling misunderstood. So, I mean, <laughs> this fuck. This, welcome to welcome to the 2024 election. <laughs> You m mentioned the desire to do battle, quote unquote. Um, and then you also talked about worrying, which is, you know, um, uh, in line with, you know, the worrying is anti-Stoicism. <laughs> You're very much like a, a student of Stoicism. And I suppose like, right, right. And battling is kind of like the more caustic form of worrying, you know, and as, as little as it seems to accomplish, right. And for as much mental space as it occupies and, uh, yeah, I mean, I think like um, the bigger game I'm after is a kind of like larger kind of solidarity and being with with my fellows and being 
part of the solution rather than part of the problem. And I think that um, a lot of my battling is an expression of my own feeling of powerlessness uh, over things that really disturb me. And um, I, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I hope our listeners won't be offended. Those, those few Trump uh, fans uh, who are tuning in, bless you. Um, but um, I'm hoping, uh, you know, I'm hoping that uh, democracy prevails. Um, I've got a preference in this election and, I'm, and I'm, I care about you guys. You know, I want, I want it to work out. We have to have patience with the, with the process and with each other. Because, because, like I said, the end of this election is not the end of this problem. Right. Because, we'll all need to sit down the, with each other the people, afterwards. The people who yeah. are, we're voting for, they're, they're symptomatic. They're symptoms of our, of, of our, you know, of our system. And we're, you know, and the polar, you know, you know, and the truth is I have been ever since I was writing about stuff earlier in the century, the, I mean, the first thing I wrote about and kept writing about was polarization. And, and it's like, it was nothing like it is now. I mean, it's like, this is, this is polarization on steroids. You know, but but we had it back then, and it's and it was a problem back then. Well, uh, let's resolve to bring a little bit of that uh, dignity and comedy back, if if such is possible. Tinge your life, tinge your myth. Cultivate your narrative with whomever you.